Hello, I'm Marilyn Moore. This is the fifth and last part of my interview with George H. Smith discussing his first book, Atheism, The Case Against God. I'm in Peoria, Illinois. Behind me is a statue of Robert Ingersoll. Ingersoll was a lawyer, an orator, and a free thinker. He was widely known as a man of intelligence, honesty, and great kindness. Because of his religious beliefs, however, his lack of belief, really, Ingersoll was labeled the great agnostic, and in some circles, the great infidel. These labels cost him, socially and politically. In this last part of the interview, George discusses agnosticism and atheism, highlighting some of the common prejudices people hold against free thinkers. He also explains why he never has, and never will, publish a revised edition of Atheism, The Case Against God. George, hello. Hello. Nice to see you. I just have a couple more questions about your book. Sure. I'd like to start with Robert Ingersoll. You mentioned earlier in the interview that Robert Ingersoll was one of your free thought influences. Uh, I did a little research, and Ingersoll called himself an agnostic, and right. was even known as the great agnostic. And I'm wondering, is there a difference between an agnostic and an atheist? Okay, this is something I discuss in a fair amount of detail in uh, Atheism in the Case Against God. And uh, my treatment is, or was, maybe still is, fairly controversial. So I'll say a few words about it. First of all, in regard to Ingersoll, of course, Ingersoll, for those viewers who may not be familiar with him, was a very prominent Republican politician in post-Civil War America and called himself an agnostic. But at one point Ingersoll said, and I believe this is an exact quote, that there's not a dime's worth of difference between an agnostic and an atheist. He seemed to understand that. Uh, there's an old joke, goes I first heard it in high school back in the 60s, that um, an agnostic is an atheist with a wife and two children meaning that an agnostic is sort of the respectable term okay. that people use okay. for atheist. Because if you say you're an agnostic, people think, oh, he doesn't really know, or she doesn't really know, and very thoughtful person. If you say you're an atheist, it sounds dogmatic. Well, let me just explain my take on this. And I must say that I, this was not original when I wrote Atheism in the Case Against God. I didn't know that. I just sort of reasoned it out. It was later that I read that the, my argument had actually been advanced by a number of earlier freethinkers. Okay and even by non-free thinkers, and most prominently by a theologian, historian, he was a Christian, very good Christian scholar, late 19th, early 20th centuries, named Robert Flint. He wrote a book called Agnosticism, a very thick book. And I learned that what I had said was said before me in different terms, but exactly the same meaning before, uh, long before I wrote uh, my first book. Let me, uh, this can be a little tricky to explain, let me first approach this by asking two different questions. One question is, do you believe in God? Now here we have to bypass the problem of what is God. Let's assume we have some vague idea that God is a supernatural being. So um, the first question, question one, is do you believe in God? The second question is, do you know if a God exists or not? Okay, those are two different questions. Now, I maintain, as I explained, I believe, in the first part of our interview, that atheism, in my idea, and, and the idea of most freethinkers, is the absence or lack of belief in God. Thus, if I ask you, or if you ask me, do you believe in God, I would say no. Or, if I were a theist, a God-believer, I would say yes. Now, that pretty much excludes any middle ground, because agnosticism, in the minds of many people, is an I-don't-know answer. Well, what does it mean to say, I don't know? And that to that question. I don't know if I believe in a God or not. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I suppose a stickler could argue there are degrees of probability and you might say, well, I think it's possible but not certain. Well, I would still ask, do you assent to the proposition God exists? That's what belief means. A cognitive belief is to give your mental assent. And if to say, if you're asked, do you believe in a God or that a God exists, and you say, I don't know, that reflects a state of mental confusion more than anything else. It means you just haven't really thought the issue through. Okay. Now consider the second question. Uh, do you know if a God exists? Or we could simply say, does a God exist? Would be a better way of putting that. 
Well, if you say, does a God exist, there's three possible answers. You say, yes, I, I know a God exists. Uh, the other extreme would be, no, I know a God does not exist. Or the middle ground would be, I don't know. Now, the I don't know answer to that question, does a God exist or do you know a God exists, is the traditional agnostic position, meaning someone who says he doesn't know one way or the other. But that answers a different question. It doesn't answer the question of the presence or absence of belief. It asks a question about knowledge. Those are two separate issues. Now, in, the, in my in Atheism is a Case Against God, I discussed the origin of the term. The, the term agnosticism was actually coined by um, uh, T.H. Huxley, the famous Darwin's bulldog. He was himself, called himself an agnostic. And I haven't uh, looked at this story in many years, but as I recall, Huxley joined something called the Metaphysical Society. And he was joking, he had a pretty good sense of humor. And he said that uh, all the people there seemed to have ists, I-S-T, of one kind or another. They were this, this type of ist or that type of ist. And as I recall his language, he said he was out without a rag of, uh, of a cover, to, um, rag of a name to cover himself, something like that. He didn't know what to call himself. And he thought, being this sort of hardcore scientist type, that all this talk about the existence of God was just so much not nonsense, but just some metaphysical speculation that we couldn't really know one way or the other. So he coined the term agnostic to indicate that he just thought all this was unknowable. His friend, Herbert Spencer, who I've written a lot about, also called himself an agnostic with the exact same meaning. Herbert Spencer said, as far as the ultimate cause of things is concerned, we just don't know and we'll never know. It's beyond our comprehension. There was an epistemological theory behind this, having to do with the limits of human knowledge, which I don't agree with. But the, the, the agnostic position was not just that the, the existence of God is unknown, it's unknowable. Mm. Now that is the traditional agnostic position. Today when people say, I'm an agnostic, they generally just mean, oh, I haven't made up my mind, I'm not certain, I don't know. They don't really understand the history of the term, the etymology of it, uh, and therefore it's used in a very loose way. Now having with that rather long prelude, here's my, how I classify this. To, say an, to be an agnostic, can, you can either be an atheist or you can be a theist. In other words, agnosticism, because it answers a different question, cuts across both lines. Mm -hmm. It's not an either or. It's not a middle way. If you're an agnostic atheist, what that means is you don't believe in God because you believe the existence of God is ultimately unknowable. It gives a reason for the atheism. It gives a reason as to why you do not believe. If you're an agnostic theist, and there have been many, by the way, uh, that indicates something a little different. It means, yes, I believe in God, but I believe that the nature of God is ultimately unknowable. The unknowability factor comes in again, but this time in regard not to the existence, but to the nature of God. So you can be an agnostic, and you can either be a theist or you can be an atheist. It classifies according to different criteria because it answers a different question. And again, I'll just repeat in conclusion, those questions are, do you believe in God? Basically, that's a yes or no question. Uh, and does God exist? Yes, I know a God exists. I don't know if a God exists. Or no, a God, I know a God does not exist. So that's, that's the, the difference. So I don't accept agnosticism as some kind of escape hatch okay. or polite term, you know, some way to get out of being called an atheist. Because ag most agnostics are, in fact, non-believers. They don't believe in God, and that makes them an atheist. I hope that was that sufficiently clear. I know it's a little. So you think agnostic in this at this point in time means someone who just hasn't thought it through? In practice, that's what it amounts to. Most people I know that I ask the free thinkers, you know, they say, "Well, I don't know if God exists or not," so I'm an agnostic. And I said, "But do you believe in God?" Well, no, I don't believe in a God. Well, that makes you an atheist. What's the reason this gets confusing, Marilyn, is because many people cleave to that that misleading definition of atheism is the absolute denial of God's existence, that so-called positive atheism, whereas I defend a negative conception as the absence of belief. Now, if you accept the positive definition is the only way you can fit. Uh, uh, if I positively affirm the non-existence of God, I'm making a knowledge claim. I'm not simply making a statement about what I do and don't believe. By the way, I just, for clarity's sake, something I haven't really written about, because I still get a lot of flack about this. If you go on the internet and you look under, I think there's a whole Wikipedia article based on my discussion, or, and I'm, it brings in Flint about his conception of agnosticism. The re one reason this was so important in the Christian tradition 
And the reason this view of negative atheism developed, meaning the absence of belief, because in Christianity, traditionally, the only thing that matters is whether you believe in or not, in, in God or in Jesus. It's belief that gets you to heaven, and non-belief that sends you to hell. They don't care whether you claim to know or not know whether God exists. It doesn't matter why you believe in God. It can be on faith. It can be for some other reason. Okay. But it, it, in Christian theology, traditionally, the key is belief versus non-belief. And if you were a non-believer, you were an atheist, because that's what sends you on the fast track to hell. That was the important element in Christianity. The element of whether can we know a God exists or can we know that a God doesn't exist was a secondary consideration. Uh, and for various reasons I won't go into to here, later theologians who wanted to paint atheists as being totally unreasonable people and to portray atheism itself as more or less an unthinkable position, it's absurd on its face, they're largely the ones who came around and said, well, these atheists claim that a God does not exist. And then they'd go on and say, but how can they possibly know that? Because you'd in fact have to be omniscient. You'd have to in effect have investigated every nook and cranny of the universe and said, I've looked everywhere and there's no God there. And they therefore framed this positive definition, this story's a bit more complicated than this, but they basically framed this positive definition as what I call a short and easy refutation of atheism. You don't have to take atheists seriously because they make this dogmatic claim, they accuse us of being dogmatic, but they're far more dogmatic because they claim to know that nowhere in the universe does a God exist. That's why the positive definition has remained so popular among theologians. Whereas the atheists have been saying, no, we don't believe in a God. And uh, we don't claim necessarily that a God does not exist because, as I said before, you haven't even defined what you mean yet. So how can we say X doesn't exist when X is just an empty blank? We don't know what you're talking about. So that's the, uh, that's the position I take on atheism and agnosticism. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, Atheism, the Case Against God, it remains a, a well-known book 40 years after you wrote it. I noticed that booktalk.org uh, puts it number nine on the list of the top ten books on atheism. And I'm wondering if you've ever thought about publishing a new edition. Well, actually, that's an interesting question because that issue did come up. I'm trying to remember the exact year. I, I can't recall the exact year. It was around 1997, maybe 98. I was living in San Francisco. I got a call from Paul Kurtz. Uh, Kurtz is a name that will be familiar to pre-thinkers. He was, I believe, the founder of Prometheus Books, written quite a few books on philosophy, considered one of the leading humanist of pre philosophers. And I have known Paul, I don't know if I've met him in person, but I've talked to him on the phone at various times, and he asked me if I would be interested in doing a revised edition of the book for Prometheus, because the book has done well for them, and uh, among free thinkers it's very well known. I told him that I wanted to think about it, uh, and I'd call him back in a few days, which I did. I thought about it and called him back, and what I said to him was, what well, I'll just repeat to you, was, you know, I understand the reason for wanting a new edition. I mean, it might sell to people who already bought the first edition from a sales point of view. I said, I have certain problems myself with the book, as I hope anyone would with the book they wrote 30 years earlier, uh, or whenever, however long it was at that point. And if you haven't learned anything in 30 years or whatever, then, you know, you're not, your mind's, well, it's 40 now, but back when this happened, it was like 30. And uh, <clears throat> so, I had thought through, I gave a talk on the 10th anniversary in Los Angeles at the LA Press Club of a publication of Atheism Against, Against God. And much of that talk, and it was well attended, talked about what I would change or what I would write differently then after 10 years. And there were a number of things that I would change. But my, my position with Paul Kurtz was, look, it was written in my early 20s. It was written with a certain innocent enthusiasm, a polemicism, if you will. And it's, it basically, I let it all hang out. As you get older, at least as I've gotten older, you tend to get more cautious, you get more concerned about scholarship, I mean, the, the fine points of scholarship, and what will some audi particular audience think of this, because you make these generalizations. Well, that problem, the problems I have with the book now, and I have later, have to do with certain things that I think are over simplified generalizations. I haven't changed any of my philosophical views, so don't misunderstand me. It has to do with comments like Christianity has done this and it's done that. Well, Christianity is a very broad abstraction. It's like talking about all of Western civilization and I sometimes didn't distinguish between different types of Christianity, different strains of thought within Christianity. 
Um, but then again, when you start making all those qualifications, you end up saying perhaps, and in most cases, and you make all these linguistic, these stylistic, and it becomes just boring after a while. And sometimes you just have to let it go and just say what you want to say and assume that people know that you're generalizing. But to make, uh, to summarize the, the point here, I decided that the, the, the source of the virtues of that book are the, was the same as the source of its flaws namely my youthful enthusiasm. A lot of people like that book, especially younger people, because I think they identify with it. I show a certain amount of um, anger at times about Christianity, and I've had many, especially younger people, write to me and say, you know, I felt like that, and I was so happy that to find someone else that felt like that. They felt like they were taken for a ride, that they were being lied to by whoever, whoever their Christian teachers were. Uh, it's like I gave them a right to be resentful to a certain extent and angry about it. Because you're, you're inculcated with this whole garbage even today, like it's not good form to be at all dismissive or rude about religious beliefs, even if they're not your own. You're supposed to be ultra polite to everyone, ultra respectful, except to atheists. You can be as nasty as you want <laughs> to atheists. Well, I'd had it up to here by that time, and I thought, look, I'm going to write this in the same style that Christians write about atheism. I remember thinking that to myself. I would read a lot of Christian books on atheism. They generalize, they make all kinds of attacks and so forth. I don't mean to be, as, I didn't want to be as inaccurate, obviously, as those attacks are, but I thought, why do they, do these people deserve any better than what they give to atheists? And I know it bothered a lot of people, oh, you're not being fair, and you, you let, and I've had so many discussions with people about, oh, you left out this person, you didn't consider this argument, and like, it's supposed to cover every over the last 2,500 years, every argument about Christianity or theology. And, uh, but my attitude towards the polemicism was, you know, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to write it like I feel it. And it's, an, it's a thoroughly honest book in that sense. So the problem, as I related to Paul Kurtz, was if I tried to rewrite it now, I couldn't just patch it up here and there, because I'm a much different person than in my 50s, now in my 60s, now than I was in my early 20s. And what I would end up doing, probably in the final analysis, was making it better in the sense of maybe a bit more accurate, but also worse in the sense of making it much more boring. Because I cover a lot of fairly technical material, but because of the polemicism that's in it, that kind of hopped up polemicism from time to time, also makes it interesting to a certain group of readers. Now, professional philosophers hate that, and that's why most, not all, a few liked it, but most don't like that book, because it's written in that free thought polemical style, which is the style I grew up in. These same people don't seem to have a problem when theologians say things about atheism in that same style, but they have that kind of respectable philosophers, don't get all emotional, they don't get polemical, they just minutely analyze an argument. You know, I don't, I'll just tell you a little story I don't think I've ever told before about how seriously I take a lot of those arguments. Part three of that book, which deals with the arguments for the existence of God, in the original version, I didn't even have that in there. I thought that the other three version, the other three parts, which goes through problems in the concept of God, and I thought that so thoroughly destroyed the case for Christianity, it wasn't even necessary to get into the arguments, like the first cause argument, the design argument. And I thought, because they had been so thoroughly refuted and dis dissected by so many philosophers before me, what is the point? So I took in the manuscript to my publisher, and I remember telling him how overdue it was, but my editor there, Sylvia Cross, she said, George, I think you really should put in a section on the arguments. And I said, Sylvia, you know, I've already done the job I need to do. And she said, well, most people are expecting it. And so she convinced me to go back and spend another couple months writing that third section. But in the original version, I had no intention of putting it in. It shows you, in a sense, how little regard I have for the arguments in the old final analysis. Because the earlier part of the book, the first half, deals more with the conceptual confusion and the very concept of God. And once you establish that the concept itself is essentially meaningless or self-contradictory or incoherent, Going on to discuss these arguments just seemed to me superfluous. So um, that, so the fact they're in there at all, that I paid the respect to these arguments at all that I gave them, was just because my editor wanted me to include them. But um, so again, to go back to your original question, no, I would never consider rewriting it because I, it, it, it's a snapshot of a moment in time in my intellectual journey and my emotional feelings about religion. I don't feel nearly as I'm not even sure hostile is the right word because I wasn't especially hostile at that time, but it was a sort of a no-take-prisoners approach, uh, take-no-prisoners approach, excuse me, 
if you read the last section alone, The Ethics of Jesus, I attacked Jesus' moral teachings of all yes, things. Now, there was a book that did that as well, that I drew from to some extent. Uh, I think it's called An Atheist Values by a guy named Robinson, and he's a regular philosopher. But most free thinkers don't even do that. Here I'm attacking him for teaching these monstrous ethic moral theories, which is unusual. I did that just to sort of tweak the nose of free think, too many free thinkers who sort of kowtow to that, oh, he was a wonderful moral teacher, but his teachings have been corrupted by the church. No, he wasn't. And as I went out, he was pretty much a standard run of the mill. If we just take him at face value, without getting into all historical issues about if he existed at all, and if he did exist, what did he really teach? If we just take the moral teachings of the New Testament, many of them can be found in the Old Testament. Many of them are just more or less the cliched moral teachings at the time. No, he was not a great moral teacher. I'm sure he was an okay guy. He got a raw deal from the Romans. But no, he was not one of the great moral teachers of all, in all time, of all time, because for one thing, he just, he just comes out with little parables and little sayings. There's no argument there. He wasn't a philosopher. And I'm sure for the kind of, at the time, I'm sure he was a kind person if he existed as portrayed at all, like in the Gospels. If we overlook all of the sayings about the weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell, and if you don't believe him, you're going to be, I mean, who says that, really? What do you think of a person, if you don't believe me and, and follow me, you're going to end up to eternal torment in hell. Now, if you happen to buy the stuff that he's the son of God or he's God himself, then maybe, but... What would you think of a guy today that came around and said, either you accept my teachings or you're going to burn in hell? Some preachers say that, but no rational person takes them seriously. And now, and, and the final thing I'll say about this, about the teachings of Jesus, is that a lot of people say, well, that's not fair. You have to look at it in this historical context. But that's not the way Christians look at him. They, teach him, they present him as this eternal character. Jesus was being God himself, if you believe in the Trinity, or the Son of God in whatever interpretation. Uh, when they're preaching him, they don't say, well, you have to sort of look at him in his historical context, says, no, either you believe or you burn. That's the traditional evangelical or fundamentalist view. And you can't have it both ways. You can't say on the one hand, well, you're being too hard on the guy because you're taking the Bible too literally, when the whole point, and I know there's all these liberal Christians today, says, oh, we don't take it literally. In other words, they, they gerrymander the Bible. The stuff they like about Jesus, they say, oh, yeah, he probably said that, because it agrees with their own moral teachings. I discussed this in my first book as well. The stuff they don't like, they go, oh, he couldn't have possibly ever said that, because he's not that kind of a fellow. He never would have said that. That must have been a later interpolation. Anyway, I go through all that in the book, but um, no, I, I wouldn't consider it revision, I would, it, because it would be a totally different book. I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it. Okay. So it, it's best to leave it warts and all, because I do think it has some warts in it. Thank you. Thank you, George. Well, you've answered all my questions about the book, and I want to thank you very much for taking the time to do so. Uh, you've raised many more questions in my mind during these uh, interviews, and I'm wondering if you would answer one more question. Sure. Would you let me interview you again in the future? Sure. You mean about religion or about Christianity or anything? Sure. I enjoy it. You're welcome to. Thank you. Thank okay. you.